member wishes to vote differently, please let me know. Thank you. So, could I call on Councillor Stevenson, first white paper? Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. A recent report from the Institute of Fiscal Studies that children from better off households have been spending at least 75 minutes a day on additional activities and their peers from poor households during lockdown. Because a full reopening of schools has not yet taken place, gaps in disadvantaged pupils and their classmates will double to three weeks by September. This is why it's so important that we reopen schools for all pupils by September at latest. <coughs> it's also the reason why I welcome the government's £1 billion mm -hmm. in COVID catch up and congratulate the Conservative Chair of the Select Committee for securing it. Because of this direct investment, disadvantaged children in Leeds will benefit as, as the entire education system wraps around them to help overcome the time lost during lockdown. A few moments ago before the tea break, Lord Councillor criticised the lack of support for the summer activity programme, yet it is administration that has been in those who wanted to keep schools closed until September. Anybody concerned about the educational outcomes of social mobility technology is why it has been so damaging to keep children out of school. Indeed, further to Councillor Blake's comments just now, she will know that four former Labour Secretary of State gave, gave damning verdicts on the action of teaching unions in encouraging school staff to work against the June reopening. Lord Blunkett went further by accusing the unions of working against the interests of children by keeping them at home despite all of the evidence pointing to a longer term impact on the turn. It is disappointing the Council did not take a leadership role in encouraging schools to reopen more widely in June. But we thank those school leaders, staff, governors and parents who have been working tirelessly to support their pupils during the pandemic. They stood up for what they thought was the right thing to do, they had the courage to ignore the more militant elements, and as such, teachers have the thanks of parents right across this city. Across Europe, pupils have been getting an advantage on school children lead. In Denmark, schools reopened on the 15th of April. In Austria, Germany, France and Greece, pupils have been back in classrooms since May. It is a fact that the, the longer list pupils remain outside of educational settings, the wider the gap between the most affluent and the poorest pupils will grow. My board map, the road back normality will be a bumpy one, but the commitment of a £1 billion COVID catch up plan, alongside additional £1.7 billion for new school rebuild, repair, and upgrade, will surely help that journey. It should be a priority for the city that all children and young people are back in school in December at the very latest, and I therefore propose this motion calling the council to actively facilitate that endeavour. Thank you, Mayor. Sorry, thank you. Can I have a first second? Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. And it's a pleasure to follow on Councillor Stevenson and to second this white paper, uh, simply because I believe it's a statement of intent. A statement of intent, not only about getting our kids back in September, which I'm glad to see that colleagues from across the chamber have mentioned, it, but also to support to our schools the in desperate need of a rebuild. And it has been a flagrant issue among councillors over the past few months, but particularly about Lloyd and Webby. And before I go any further, because I'm sending this motion, I want to call the amendments that are going to be put forward later, very briefly. In the amendment that will be put forward by Labour Party, I suspect Councillor Prime Minister will be repeating many of their speeches and their comments they've already had. Councillor Blake said there was a lack of confidence that parents had in schools. Well, as Councillor Stevenson has said, that was based also a lack of clarity that came on the top of Leeds City Kendall from Councillor Blake and from Councillor Pryor, touring the various different papers in their comments to make sure that they weren't aware of whether Leeds schools were going to be open from the top. So, as well, and others have said that Education is not a priority for the Conservative group. Councillor Pryor and colleagues tell that to the Webby Ward Councillors who've secured half of the funding to rebuild Webby High School. And also say that when it comes to rights, because they've been left behind by councillors of all and various colours. And the reason for this repair is due to years of neglect by this authority, patched up by the Labour Party. For example, let's not forget, yes, 10 years of the austerity that Councillor Pryor will include his speech, would be for that 13 years of government with the priority of education, education, education. And in that time, what happened for Royce? Well, they didn't even fix the roof while the sun was shining under a lay government. So when Labour members stand up and say those later on, just reflect on those. Because this can be a statement of intent. A statement of intent that can come from every single member across the council to say that we prioritise our kids' education. Putting them back in school ASAP, rather than dilly-dallying around and blaming it on each other because you don't want to support a government and political purposes. The simple fact is that nationally published research in 2017 by the Education Policy Institute said, it's more than any other authority in England in 2017, the gap at the end of primary school where disadvantaged kids were worse off than all the pupils nationally than in any other authority across the country. And as Count Stevenson said, DfE officials have all said at the beginning throughout this crisis, there could even potentially be an attainment gap that wide as much as 75% because of coronavirus between those who are either potentially disadvantaged and those of their peers. 
So when we talk about all this, can I finish your sentence? Yeah. We've got apprentices about build, build, build. So submit the relations, get them in, and let's get those rules revealed. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Fossat. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, firstly, I'd like to add my profound thanks to all the teachers, teachers, support staff, and officers who've worked so hard to assure that most vulnerable children and most of key workers continue to be offered an education school. Provided pupils remaining at home resources for their education, free school meals, or vouchers for those entitled to them during the very difficult first months of the COVID pandemic. I also applaud all those parents and carers who homeschooled their children. The government has issued guidance for the full opening of schools in September. However, many head teachers, teachers, unions, and not least parents have expressed their deep concerns about how this can work. But this week, we're hearing from scientists and medical professionals that we should expect a second wave of the coronavirus pandemic in the autumn and winter, with possibly more than double the number of deaths than we've already seen. Schools are back to business as usual in September, with 30 children in classrooms, albeit organised in bubbles. There will be no social distancing, and the likelihood of a second wave becomes much higher. So, what could be done? This is a capacity issue in terms of facilities and staffing. Education does not all have to be in schools, other facilities in the community could be used. There's a very real impact on children of the impact on children's health of the COVID-19 emergency lockdown, especially though already disadvantaged due to inequality and health issues. But we know what is good for our mental and physical health, so let's give children many more opportunities for outdoor play and games, use our natural green spaces more and create more opportunities for art activities. None of these have to be delivered in school premises, but they could all be used to deliver core parts of the curriculum like looks in numeracy. I'm joined up thinking that we can blend with creation and use of volunteers in the community. The national governance allows for a more flexible curriculum until next summer, and this proposal fits well with their own, in our own 3A strategy, particularly priorities one and three. School need to and can plan for the whole year to create confidence for parents, school staff, and not least the children in education being provided. These remarkable education staff have already gone above and beyond what might be expected of them and now completing yet more risk assessments in mind in September. We need to offer them all our support and provide them with more capacity to plan for a flexibly delivered curriculum. Government needs to provide the national the necessary financial support. And I will, I will uh, add to the calls for that be more locally, um, the more local um, support for that. But if this is lacking in the proposal, this proposal gives leads another opportunity to provide the innovative leadership that's already shown in a way that it's managed the COVID crisis so far. Please support this amendment. Thank you. Councillor Dave Blackburn. Uh, I second and reserve the right to speak. Councillor Pryor. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, so I just want to talk through some of the changes um, the Labour men will include. Um, first of all, we want to do amend this white paper to make sure that we are putting on record our thanks to all school staff, uh, echoing a lot of comments that have gone from people from multiple parties um, earlier in this meeting. Uh, we really are proud of how leads pull together. Um, over, over crisis. And, and yes, it is vital that children return to school in a safe way. Um, but turning to government funding, um, the issue around the government funding, which I know Councillor Simpson was very quick to praise, is there's no indication of which schools will benefit. It's spread over 10 years. Late pupils need decent schools now. Um, I recently wrote a few weeks ago to the Secretary of State asking once again for the government to help rebuild Weatherby and Lloyds. And this was not the first time I've contacted uh, the government on this. The first time I did it was two years ago when I'd been in the job a couple of weeks. I, I even asked the local MD for how to settle this work across party. Uh, and I'm afraid the letter was received in the spirit it was sent in. Um, the issue of school places is not one that is going to go away. Uh, and we've done all we can uh, as leads. But now the government needs to step up and start prioritising education. So the face of a backlog of maintenance in the region of £100 million. And the money we receive from governments carrying out these repairs is 6.1 million. Um, ben Tamark has been mentioned, uh, Councillor Flynn mentioned it in, in the minutes. Yes, we use a huge number of different pots of money to, to fund the rebuild because government wouldn't fund it. Uh, Councillor Firth said that this motion would be a statement of test to ask for, for intent to ask for funding. Well, I'm delighted Councillor Firth has finally started listening to some of my speeches. I know um, <laughs> some on the other side always want to listen to uh, the administration, but this is something we've been going on about for years. And Councillor Firth is absolutely right as well. I will be repeating the ask I've made because they have been delivered. Webby needs 13 million. And yes, I'm working with the, the, water, the Webby ward members there uh, to develop a plan to fund the other half. Um, but the money, as Council First stated, well, Council First stated the money secured. It's not. That money requires the authorization from Secretary of State. We don't have that. Roids is 28 million. The need for rebuild of, of roids has been going on for years. And it's highlighted to the government on more than one occasion. And they have done nothing. And blaming a Labour government, which was a decade ago, for a decade of inaction from the Tories was a real stretch, particularly given issues around boilers and widows have developed over the past few years. The recently announced funding of around 1.6 billion is an absolute drop in the ocean when you compare it to the 6.76 billion the National Audit Office said was needed in 2017. 
bring schools in England up to satisfactory standard. Who knows how much work is needed now after another three years of government in action. Uh, the on government to its duty by children and families lead. Something I hope all members can support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, to correct Councillor Pryor, this, this isn't a Labour Party amendment. This is one that is also supported by the Liberal Democrat group as well. Uh, and I'll start this uh, second by pointing out to the likes of Councillor Firth that just because uh, you are opposition does not mean to say that you will always criticise. And I have certainly not been shy of criticising this count in the past in terms of its record on education. Uh, but on this particular case, and in particular about the funding of school buildings, it is egregious for the official opposition to try and pass all the blame for lack of investment and for the rigmarole that you have to go through as a local authority to try and get new places in the schools where you need them. To try and pass that blame onto the administration is wrong and it needs to be called out. I have to say, the motion which has been put forward by a Conservative group, it reckons to talk about the need of children. But actually, if you read it, it's far more concerned about uh, emphasising all the action which is being taken by their politicians, both nationally and locally. And the emphasis on the children is about getting through school gates on a particular deadline. Kids are not commodities to be used in what Councillor Cullen called earlier the mixed economy of schools, especially when that mixed economy is dominated almost wholeheartedly by academies. And to actually think that children should be used to get the economy going and to get a headline for any politician, whether it's national or local, is wrong. The children that we have in our schools are part of families, and the way that you get children back in school is to make those families confident that those children are going back into an environment which is fulfilling for them and is good for their education, and also to give the parents the confidence that then going back to work to allow those children back into school um, will be something which is safe for them too as well. And that all of the infrastructure around it, like school transport, is also looked into. Which brings us back to the issue of Roy School. I am a governor at that school. I know how many times that the administration, whether it was the joint administration or whether it was the Labour administration, have asked for money from government. And that money has not come forward. Latterly, it is because all new investment is only associated with new academies. And that is the basic problem for likes of Weatherby and Royds that are so-called so orphan schools. They're not orphan schools, they are traditional community schools. And those communities should be supported through fairness to get the investment that they need for their schools and <laughs> not just to be targeted to academies. Thank you. Councillor Lamb. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, this time. Um, speaking in support of uh, uh, Councillor Stevenson's white paper, the first thing I want to do is um, to make it clear that we have not one but two excellent schools in my ward. And I would hate to give the impression, because the build is not for the purpose, there's anything wrong with the education. Quite the opposite. We have a fantastic school in where there be great leadership, brilliant teachers, fantastic students, and great ethos. Uh, that's what makes a brilliant school, and that's why they deserve a building uh, that matches what they're doing inside. Um, so I've got to absolutely underline that fact. Also, I think it's important to remind council that to maintain school by the local authority. It's the local authority's responsibility to maintain that school, and it's because the local authority hasn't done that that the building is in the state in. It goes way back, uh, 12, 13, 14 years since all these issues were flagged up. So I'm sorry, Councillor Golden and Councillor Pratt, it does go back to the previous government. It's not only the last couple of years that uh, uh, this has come on the agenda. This is a long-standing issue. As Councillor Pryor acknowledged, uh, and I acknowledge the work he's done with us, um, and thank officers for the work they've done with us, um, we've worked tirelessly to try and find ways of identifying funding sources for the High School. Um, it's a significant undertaking for war members to set out to try and find funds to build a new school. We're halfway there, which is quite an achievement. Um, we do need more from the government, but we also need the council to do more. And Councillor Price should perhaps reflect on the fact that his letter writing recurringly doesn't seem to have the desired effect. Uh, I should perhaps think about how he's, uh, how he's writing his letters and the sort of things that he has to say in them. Um, if you're always having a go at the government, it's not, so it's not a surprise that they're receptive to what you have to say. So let's hope we can continue to work together. Councillor Stevens' white paper is spot on, uh, and I'm pleased to support it. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Can Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, this white paper is fundamentally about leadership. Because this white paper motion is about this Labour administration making its position clear and unambiguous, as some have said before, councillors, statements in intent that we want our young people back in school from September, and that as a council administration, you're actually going to do everything within your influence to make it so. We don't pretend you have all believers. We appreciate you don't have all the levers, but you do have influence, and how you use that influence matters greatly. 
Instead of focusing on the why we can't, which was Councillor Byers' uh, stocking phrase, instead of focusing on why we can't, it's really time this administration focus on the what we can't. Uh, because there are many things council can do to make clear to assist schools in getting back in September. I appreciate that might be harder than simply complaining about government, but it's what's needed. It's what the people of the city expect. It's what the people of the city deserve. I've seen some incredible work during lockdown uh, from incredible teachers. I've seen incredible resilience by young people. But instead of simply complaining, Councillor Prayer, indeed Councillor Colton, instead of simply complaining about uh, the government and complaining about them doing this and that, what can we do as a council? What are you going to do as the executive member to help our schools ensure that young people can start school again in September? It's time to step up to the plate. It's time to stop blaming others. And it's time to use your good offices to help our young people so we get children back to school in September, so we can close the gap on learning, so we can make sure our young people get the education they deserve, that they don't want to be a of falling behind, and that you do your part for our young people here in the city and you get onto it now. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Lady Richards, can I remind members this will be Councillor Richard made a speech? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, education has quite rightly been an important issue raised today by many people. Um, I seek in support of white paper moved by Councillor Ryan Stevenson because this motion is all about the importance of education to all our young people in Leeds. My entire working life has been spent trying to ensure that all children receive the best opportunities in life through the education they receive. Now it's clear that the pandemic has been extremely challenging for schools, staff, parents and pupils. So it's only right that other speakers have noted that we thank all schools and academies and all within them in Leeds as they have worked through their ways through the past three months. Recent circumstances have obviously impacted student access to their buildings and schools and staff have worked really hard to create virtual resources and activities to support students in the home learning environment. However, from September, it's vital that students attend schools to re-engage in a more formal and structured way. Now, all staff in schools, it is all staff, have the safety of children in mind with the systems which have been created to enable those students to return to school and restart the learning. As a member of the governing body of my local primary school, we spent last Friday morning working through, and I guess not, the 38-page risk assessment which has been put together to support re-entry of the children in September. It looked many and various ways to make it happen. And I also attended a team's meeting this morning at a large secondary school where I still work for the complete restructuring of the timetable, the development of new teaching and learning strategies and the general logistics of bringing 1,700 students back into school was shared with the whole staff. It was an amazing session showing the resilience of those staff and their determination to make a challenging situation work for the advantage of students. And it's been generally recognised that the last rooms have had a differential impact on individual students. I've seen this myself. Some have thrived in an independent learning pattern, enjoying the challenge of structuring their days and work. Others have missed the collective teaching mode and the individual care for teachers. So we've had previously positive students who have suffered by this. So I feel it's vital we address this as soon as possible. The Secretary of State for Education recently stated that education is in order to get a job. As a historian, I would better differ with him, in that it's also a vital component to find a place in society, understand your past, and look to the future for the opportunities which good education will provide. Encouraging all students to return in September is a significant step towards achieving this. And I support this motion accordingly. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Bad Anderson. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, well, what do you make of this wonderful debate today? I don't know. You know. What really grates with me more than anything else is the Labour Party shoot about a lot. It's always the government. It's always the government. They are in power. They are in control in the city. So the education of our children rests with them first, last and always. They are totally responsible for it. They don't appear to want to take responsibility when the bad news is going about all somebody else's problem. But when good news is, they're always the front say, we've done this, we've done that. You've got the resources. The point of a good council is one that takes the resources that it's got and uses those resources to best 
of its citizens. Can the Labour administration in this city really say that they are delivering for everybody? They are trying to do something for everybody with the resources that they've got. Use your intelligence. Use your forethought. Think through. Think of things you can do to help people. Bring it forward in terms of what we're trying to do. You'll get support from the Conservatives if you show willing. But you're not willing to show willing. All we want to do is criticise everybody. Today, you've tarred everybody with the same rush. Just because you're a conservative, say this, that, that. Think before you actually say anything. There are good people out there who want to do the best. There are governors out there who are determined to do what they can the best for their school. They wanted to do it. They wanted to get people back into school again. But they were held back because we, in one of the schools I'm connected with, we're all ready to go. And then all of a sudden, the council issue instructions, be careful, be careful. You know, that's not the message. You need to go out there and say to people, yes, we do need to educate children. We don't want to see people left behind. That's surely one of the leaders' mantras. We don't want anybody left behind. This, it was your chance to show the leadership in this city. You unfortunately failed, and hopefully people will remark on that when it comes to the next set of elections. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Can I call on Stephen Sis to sum up, please? Thank you. Uh, well, well, Lord Mayor, uh, I agree entirely with Councillor Anderson. I really thought a bland white paper thanking the city's teachers and asking the administration to formally bid new government and he would put such defensive results. It's uh, no surprise to us that Councillor Bolton is hiding behind Labour's amendment. We all knew the cost of a seat on the executive board and now we know the price. Uh, surprisingly, this amendment uh, from the new Labour and Dem coalition completely misses the point. Councillor Byers seems to have making a habit to writing letters lately, but it's not to the left we need. We need to actually do some work and submit a formal bid for funding. By amending the white paper, as he has, he has effectively said the council doesn't need, need to formally submit for new EFE funds because he's previously sent a short note to the Secretary of State. It simply won't do law better. If this administration spent as much effort working with the DFE to get the best of our cities just dodging accountability, the city schools would be in a much better place. As was acknowledged by Councillor Pryor, the sterling work of Weatherby Ward members over a number of years has itemised half of the required £24 million rebuild cost for Weatherby High School. One has to wonder why excessive uh, Rothwell Ward members, both Labour and Lib Dem, haven't done the same in their own wards. What we do know, Lord Mayor, is that when given the option last week to look injecting up to £7 million into Lloyd's High School, the Lib Democrats popped up Labour's plan once again to invest in Easton. It's clear in Leeds, Lord Mayor, that with this Labour and Liberal Democrat duo, it's two sides of the same rusty old coin. I welcome the spirit of Councillor Forsyth's amendment. I know that it comes from her experience having a teacher in the city. The only reason I feel unable to support the amendment in full is that the DF is already putting in place extensive guidance for schools who return in September. This was mentioned in detail by Councillor Richards, and I congratulate her making history by delivering this council's first ever virtual maiden speech. Lord Mayor, my motion acknowledges that additional funding from central government is required. As Councillor Lamb said, it's also the case that underinvestment by this council and successive governments over the past 20 years has left both Welly High School and Royce High School in particular need of attention. The Prime Minister's announcement of £1.7 billion for schools rebuild, repair and upgrade is to be welcomed. As Councillor Firth rightfully pointed out, we fear that Labour will once again miss an opportunity to fix its school rooms while the sun is shining. And with that, Lord Mayor, I move motion. Thank you. I'm now going to call for the votes. I'll only ask the Chief Whip of each group. So, we vote on the first amendment in the name of Councillor Fossar. Councillor Dawson, how do you vote? We vote against, Lord Mayor. Councillor Cohen? We are staying, my Lord Mayor. Councillor Campbell? We vote for. Sorry? We vote for the amendment. Thank you. Councillor Hutchinson? We abstain, my Lord Mayor. Councillor Dobson? Abstain, Lord Mayor. Councillor Blackburn? Paul Paul I'm sorry, but this amendment is lost. We've got a second amendment in the name of Councillor Cryer. Councillor Dawson. We look for Lord Mayor. Councillor Cohen. We are staying, my Lord Mayor. Councillor Campbell. We look for. Councillor Hutchinson. We vote for this, uh, my Lord Mayor. Councillor Dawson. I'm staying, Lord Mayor. And Councillor Blackburn. Um, for Lord Mayor. It has been carried, so Councillor mm -hmm. we will not go into substantive moment for Councillor Pryor. Councillor Dawson. Councillor Dawson? Sorry, we vote for. Councillor Coulson? Cowen, sorry, Councillor Cowen? Uh, no, we sit on the executive board, but we'll... <laughs> uh, we uh, abstain, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Campbell? 
We vote for Councillor Hutchinson. Vote for the Model Mayor. Councillor Dobson. Abstain, Lord Mayor. Councillor Blackburn. Paul, Lord Mayor. You? This vote has been carried, so. Yeah, we move to the second white paper, which is in the name of Councillor Jensen Bentley. Councillor Bentley? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I feel very privileged to, to bring this white paper to Council to recognise and support the work done by all the voluntary, unpaid, unpaid carers in the country. I'm also pleased to get the support of the administration, albeit the short amendment, which I am more than happy to accept and have incorporated into the white paper. Lord Mayor, we've all seen our awards, the tremendous work done by unpaid carers indeed. I know that there are members of this council present who fulfil these roles as well as other commitments that the council has had. Our white paper calls for more support that would improve the lives of unpaid carers and consequently the lives of those being cared for. And the very short time available, I just want to concentrate on how more support could be given to those carers who are trying to combine caring with employment. Five million people in the UK, that's one in seven of the workforce, combine caring responsibilities with work. These carers are not only paying taxes, not insurance, contributing to the growth of the economy, <clears throat> but also saving taxpayer at £95 billion pounds a year by providing unpaid care to the loved ones. There's often a false and old-fashioned image of a carer as someone who would be at home anyway, usually a woman, doesn't have a job, not to do working, but this is far from the truth. Unpaid carers are like the rest of us. They, they want careers, they have aspirations, and they want the best of the people they care for. As a state and as a society, we do not give enough support, support or protection to unpaid carers in employment. There is evidence of employers discriminating against carers when it comes to employment or promotion. Unpaid carers feel inhibited from applying for jobs or applying for promotion because of employers' attitudes. They are also reluctant to ask special adjustments like additional leave, flexible hours, homeworking, etc. as it might prejudice their employment. And although there are employers who have good working practices, regarding employees with caring responsibilities, including, I'm pleased to say, this council. There's still a lot to be done. So in conclusion, Lord Mayor, we call for carer to become a protected characteristic employment law so that employees or potential employees can't discriminate, discriminate against just because they have caring responsibilities. And move white paper, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lars? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'd like to second the white paper in the name of Councillor Jonathan Bentley. Been blown away by the humanity and support many are shown towards not just those vulnerable and shielding members of their own family, but also to friends, neighbours, and others within their community. It's been very heartwarming to see how many people have reacted to the challenges of pandemic to become the glue that has helped keep our society together. I have to say that it, this has often been the face of mixed messages from the government and certain government advisors. Advice that has often been slow in coming and then slow in implementation. I know a lot of people working in retirement apartments who could not get hold of the PP for any price early on as they were missing out of the loop. But me have stepped up to mark and then gone over and above the call of duty to help most vulnerable to keep as safe as possible whilst the shield has been to their absolute credit. During these challenging times, many people I've spoken to all political colours genuinely look to our government for true leadership and hope that they could respond accordingly. Sadly, many feel the response has not been simply good enough. Well, here's an opportunity for the government to get it right and to recognise those in the community who have been getting it right. So many people, carers, have really gone over and above and um, without them, um, it would, this the community, this you, it could collapsed, and as, as my colleague said, the so was ninety billion pounds they're worth. Let's see some of that money going back to them and protect them and their employment rights. Uh, so I think absolutely correct. The government should recognise and financially reward those carers their great acts of compassion. They should also protect against discrimination, which is this white paper shows a number of issues the government government can put in place to ensure those efforts do not go unnoticed and they are not discriminated against, and to encourage more people to help society by doing such valuable work as carers. Thank you, Lord Councillor Anderson, Caroline Anderson. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm pleased to be moving the Conservative Amendment Councillor Bent's white paper. I totally agree with the sentiment of Councillor Bentley's white paper, but it's a very emotional knee jerk reaction to something that has come to sharp focus during COVID. The whole question of how we look after carers needs to be looked at in a post COVID light. Without any of the emotional toll that COVID has taken on everyone, not just carers. While we all understand that carers do a superb job, that is not the same as actually knowing what life is like for carers day in and day out. Carers give up careers, choice about how to live their lives, sometimes forgo their own health needs and have to rely on third party help for all sorts of things. A lot of carers don't even like to admit they cares, it's just something they do out of love and devotion. 
unfortunately can't live on love. Unpaid carers set estate an absolutely huge amount of money by looking after loved ones in their own homes. It is estimated that 75,000 or 1 in 10 of the population lead are carers. Carers provide 1.5 million hours of unpaid care per week, which would cost 1.4 billion to replace that care professionally. And there are so many calls on public cars right across the city for any different services and needs, it's not realistic to expect that this can be funded by taxpayer and school. So what do we do to make their lives more comfortable and give them the support they need? Carers' allowance has recently been increased. Locally leads this trend of support and carers' leads you might have referred a number of residents to, and they do a fantastic job. There are many other third sector organisations that help too, our wonderful neighbourhood network. The government has provided funding to extend Carers UK helpline opening times and information advice so that unpaid carers are able to access trusted information and advice. Further guidance is expected to publish shortly for young carers. The government also announced a £5 million carers innovation fund as part of the Carers Action Plan. In terms of the private members bill, it is absolutely right that carers who do work are not subject to discrimination in the workplace. I can understand why carers may be reluctant to take up employment as they may feel nervous about having to ask for time off or to find a job that is flexible enough to cope with their caring responsibilities, where they may have to drop everything at a moment notice. However, I think it's important that where carers can take up employment, they are able to do so without any worry over discrimination. However, I do not feel that making caring a protected characteristic is realistic, and they create a barrier to employment rather than make it easier, as employers may shy away from employing people who are carers because of the perceived problem of the protected characteristics legislation. People across this city have been pulling together and caring for someone they might never even have met for during COVID. Yes. I've just got one sentence, Lord Mayor. I think we need a comprehensive look at carers and how we support them across the city, stepping back from the emotion of COVID. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Wentworth. Thank, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm pleased to second Councillor Anderson's um, amendment to this white paper. And I think we all recognise that carers and key workers have done an amazing job during this crisis, and particularly in my own ward. The yeah, outside um, officers and volunteers and officers of council that supported them have done a great job and a lot of this is all just been unpaid as far as volunteer care is concerned. Some people who came volunteers and thought they would just help out a bit of shopping have now become carers for people who need more than that COVID um, provided the door to open um, and then they needed more care and I think we'd all support that and I'm just surprised Councillor Bentley you missed the opportunity because we could have had a whole white paper and we'd all made those comments and we'd all be supportive of what happened with carers and how carers have been supported by both government and the council and, and then you have to turn this white paper with the four bullet points they have which, which really are not really offensive in their own words but the statement that you and councillor downs make has to bash the government again um, and a lot of carers don't want to be tagged with um, who have been a carer because they don't think they're a carer because they do it for the love of doing the job um councillor anderson's amendment um does address some of your points um and i think that they've done a bit more work with the wit you might have got to a point where um, you could have got all party agreement on this um, and also, we need to look at whether the government can provide more support, and I'm sure that uh, in autumn statement they will um, provide more support. And so I'm pleased to support uh, Councillor Karen Anderson's um, paper amendment. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Trevor to second the amendment. Sorry, to move the amendment. Councillor Trevor? Yes, sorry, Lord Mayor, I'm meeting myself. Thank you very much um, for the opportunity to recognise and celebrate the role of carers. Mayor. Their value to society is just and especially in these really do value them and we do fund carers needs and work they do there and we also fund the neighbourhood networks. It's often known that you know these third sector organisations um, do their work because we commission them to it. We want carers um, to do their work. They, uh, we pose a very small amendment to increase the carer element in universal credit. Carers allows to claim alongside universal credit but it deducted in full and in order for carers to claim universal credit to benefit from the increased carers allowance the care element of universal credit also needs to be increased in our view. Coronavirus has had a significant impact on lives of many carers. A re recent Carers UK report suggests there are an additional 2.8 million workers combining work and unpaid care since that break began. Unfortunately, this means some carers have had to reduce their hours at work or working entirely to provide this care. We've already recognised protected characteristics of the Equality Act that should be protected by law against direct discrimination or harassment because of care responsibilities. But we need to encourage employers to have care and policies. So we do do that in needs. We have uh, a lot of growing working going on. It often comes to help my being board um, and a strategy that we will adopt. Carers are included in our equality and diversity policy and in our impact assessment processes. Our carers network aims to provide information support and posting uh, for all our staff who are working carers. This is easy to be commissioned carers leads over together with them. Alongside their incredible work providing support to carers, they promote working carers issues with employers through training, events and raising awareness. Uh, we're heavily reliant on our paid carers, as has been mentioned, to help support our care sector. 
given the current financial uncertainty of housing around, across the country, this project highlights wider issues of across social care, a sector which needs more stable solutions going forward. Health care must be treated as part of an integrated system, which includes carers. Very importantly, they need that support. We need more secure financial tracking for social care generally. There needs to be a fair pay in career and social care to enable social care to compete with the sector in their recruitment um, can find today and ourselves and to care for the most vulnerable people in our communities and I need an amendment. Thank you. Councillor Tamar to skin. Thank you Lord Mayor. I would like to second Councillor Charlwood's amendment and talk about the commitment to ensuring that young carers are supposed to have equal life chances to their peers, are able to flourish and thrive are protected from possible harm and are able to attend and achieve in their education. I'm glad this white paper shines a light on the difficulties faced by young carers. Those mildly impressive young people who manage to combine their school with looking after a loved one. Young carers can carry out complex or physical tasks such as shopping, budgeting, cooking, assisting someone with physiotherapy or looking after the siblings, often in difficult circumstances, without support and isolated from their peers who have more opportunities to enjoy their childhood. Our adults and health and children and families directorates alongside the CCG jointly fund the Leeds Young Carers Support Service, delivered by Family Action. They offer advice, information and targeted support through one-to-one -one work and group work in schools, community venues and homes. There is a strong role in awareness raising in schools and other agencies to help in identification of young carers who are often hidden in communities and inform them of the support that is available to them. As part of this, they are currently working with schools to develop the school standards with similar action all schools can take to improve the learning experience and outcomes for young carers. We also have young carers working group with representatives from adults in the health, children and families, primary health care, schools, voluntary sector and representatives with lived experience. This group is responsible for implementing a strategic action plan that sits under the, under the carers partnership strategy. Elsewhere, Carers Leads also provide a support, a support service to 16 to 25 year olds with one-on-one -on -one support sessions, advice and emotional support. They also run group sessions, activity and day trips to enable young adult carers to have a break and meet other young people who are caring. We must not get complacent and ensure we continue to listen to what young carers have today. As a city, we must do our best to assist them and move any barriers they may face in life. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Anne Blackburn. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I think that uh, all councillors in their wards have carers whether the carers be young, middle-aged or old, all have all are looking and caring for uh, usually somebody in, in their family. Unpaid work, lots of hours. Uh, I'm sure some of the councillors will know themselves, as I do, go back some, some years uh, with, with an elderly mother. Um, that in my case, my mother Whatever happened, did not want to go in home. She wanted to keep her independence, and where she couldn't, then we arranged for her to come and live nearer um, to us, about two minutes away, so we could provide hot meals for her, running up and down to the flat. That sort of thing is what carers do, and they do lots of things, but that's just an example. But it's not, you know, it's not only that. People do it, not for money. It, it's for love. Because in, in the case if it's an elderly parent, they look after you, so you, you look after them. Um, so certainly, the they you have um, carers, they are helping the council. Because for every person, oh, I'm, thinking, I'm working on more on elderly people, but as I said, carers come in all ships and dice, but uh, for elderly people, it means that it's one less person going in. Councillor Blackburn? I think we've asked Councillor Blackburn. Could we ask Councillor Latty and Bill if he returns? Councillor Diane Latty? Trying to get in. There we are. Can you hear me, Lorna? I can. Jolly good. Well, thank you, Lorna. I'm speaking in support of Councillor Anderson's amendment. I don't appear to have the camera anyway. Never mind. 
Well, uh, I think we're all in agreement about the tremendous contributions on care has made to the health and care system and to our city and its people more generally. And I'd like to add my voice to this paying tribute to the efforts of our paid carers and indeed all key workers and NHS staff who have done so much to help people through the COVID-19 pandemic. Unpaid carers are people often no formal training or professional care experience who are by definition not paid for the services they provide who are nevertheless indispensable in providing care and support to thousands of people in need. Roughly a tenth of the population of Leeds fall into this category and they get from all walks of life. And we, I'm sure you all know someone who is an unpaid carer or has been or will be at some point in their lives. There are some two outstanding figures, uh, some of which may have uh, been mentioned already, but which bear repeating. Carers provide 1.5 million hours of unpaid care per week. That's per week in Leeds. It would cost 1.4 billion a year to replace that care, according to figure that went to the health and well being bill in 2019. And those figures are undoubtedly the only growing larger. The question then is about how we share our support for our carers. I think so what the government has done so far is well, as noted in the end. The rate of carers' allowance has been increased and funding has been provided to extend the Carers UK helpline, an opening time in the information and advice services. And we also await the longest new guidance aimed at helping young carers. Lord Mayor, we recognise that more can and should be done to help and pay carers, particularly around removing barriers to employment and ensuring that they have the support they need to keep doing what they are doing. But we need to get a balance right. In many cases, what that balance is, we're there between individual carers. I think we can agree that we want to support unpaid carers, and we can agree that we need to do more, but more consideration is needed of what actions to take. Hopefully some of these questions can be tackled in the forthcoming guidance on the long-awaited social care green paper. I support the amendment of Emma Thank you, Mayor. Councillor Fair? Yeah, Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Apologies, I've lost connections. I've literally just logged back on, so can you all hear? Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. Apologies. Um, well, it's um, I have to be honest with Council today. I was cautious about speaking in this debate. And the reason I was cautious to speak in this is simply because of the fact, as many of you know, uh, I for many years cared for my mum until December, uh, unfortunately, when she passed away. And as a result, it's become a difficult subject not only from admitting before when bashfulness stops you from admitting your care sometimes to then trying to deal with the fact that you then really want to deal with the issue. And it means that in many ways, I feel that. Uh, Sometimes I'm qualified to talk on this, sometimes I'm not. I'm not qualified to talk on it because I haven't had to go through the coronavirus situation. I've been a big carer, despite having been a, a carer for a long time since I was in the last year at primary school. But I must say that I appreciate the intent here in this white paper. But I think there is one area that we really need to look at further, which is that of the plight of young carers. Because I'm concerned that the white paper only includes the matter of free travel on bus services. And actually, they're not included in the DWP, the Social Security System, Welfare System. And it means that as a result, we need to really actively look at how we can support your carers better. I have to be frank as well, carers needs to do a fantastic job in a city. But as a young carer, and even really up until I became a counsellor, I didn't know about carers lead. Maybe that was my own reluctance to admit what I was. Or maybe it even was potentially that I had just slipped through a net. So it's very difficult because the carers I know find it difficult to admit. And then as a result, you feel that you're actually uh, trespassing territory you shouldn't be trespassing in when you admit you're talking about your loved ones that you're wanting to and claim the mantle of being a carer. So I think we've got to be careful we don't act in emotion on this. And instead, we wait for the green paper, but we certainly set out our intent for how we're going to support young carers and carers of society. The fact that we've got, I believe, according to Carers UK and Carers Lead, there was figures of 6.5 unpaid carers, 6.5 million carers across the whole of the country, has increased by about 4 million during the crisis. So I hope we can take this uh, stock and realise where we are, not to act as a knee jerk, make sure that we make it proper and right in the response we have, so that we can deal that they can admit when they're a carer, but actually they do seek out help rather than feeling bunkered at home and having to deal with pressures every day life and having to then potentially miss out on support that will really help them and really push them on. They never thought it was possible. So I think that's all I can say, Lord Mayor, but I appreciate the sentiments that people have said in their speeches. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cotway. Uh, thank you, my Lord Mayor. In fact, I wasn't uh, expecting to get to speak to you today. And I'm very honest, my Lord Mayor, this is one of those occasions where have just listened to Council of Earth, uh, I'm very much a man of, well, how does one top that? How does one follow that? And in fairness, Lord Mayor, I don't think one really can, because we've had the privilege of hearing from somebody who was for so many years a carer who had walked the walk and didn't need to simply talk the talk. My one comment, Lord Mayor, uh, is that I think it's a shame that on a white paper that is certainly uh, well-intentioned, uh, there wasn't an opportunity as whips 
to find a form of words. I don't think we would have been a million miles away that we didn't as whips seek to find a form of words that we could have supported across the piece, across the party that we would have needed uh, to amend. I think uh, Councillor Anderson's amendment is a very sensible amendment. Uh, and indeed, I think the comments that Councillor Watworth made about waiting to see at what is likely to come in some months uh, from the Chancellor to further this carries is also going to be incredibly helpful. Uh, with that, Lord Mayor, I uh, very much support Councillor Anderson's uh, and Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Thank you. Can I call Councillor Bentley to sum up? Councillor Bentley? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, that was really well timed, but I've only just managed to get my connection back on uh, into debate and unfortunately missed some of the uh, contributions um, and one from Councillor Firth I was looking forward to. In fact, when I saw his name on the order paper, it looked as if he wasn't going to speak. So I please do I'm sorry that I miss it because I know the um, experience and uh, knowledge and, and wisdom that he brings to his caring role. So I'm sorry to miss that perhaps. Uh, but <laughs> there's, there's a lot of good contributions and, and I think the spirit of everybody is there. Um, supporting this. I'm always disappointed when, particularly when people say, oh, well, had you written a different way, we could have supported it. Well, we write, write papers to get across what we want to get across, and whether the Conservatives are going to support it or not is not really that high in our priorities. And I think the, the two speeches that came from Councillor Anderson and Councillor Wadsworth were really two speeches looking for a amendment, because the amendment that they've Ten um, doesn't really get it anywhere. It it it, it sort of looks at um, how carers are uh, the good that they do, and it says and more should be done. Well, without saying anything about it. Anyway, the, the support from Councillor Howard um, is very much appreciated. I'm sorry I couldn't we couldn't spend more time on young carers. That could be different um, different thing or a different way they put together. Um, but let's come back to what we're actually asking for. We're asking for recognition and support. And yes, as Councillor Blackburn said, some people do uh, do this just for love. Uh, that's fine. But as 1.2 million carers are living in poverty because they're doing it for love. That's their reward for devotion and for saving taxpayer so much money. And unpaid carers are so essential to the nation's health and care system. It, it would collapse without unpaid carers. And Cattle Anderson says, oh, well, the carer's uh, allowance has gone up. Well, yes, it went by £1.10 a week, and it's gone to £67.25 a week, which is the lowest of all care or all the allowances the government pay. But as soon as you start to work, and you and start earning £128 a week, you, lo you lose it. You know, that's threshold. And that means it worked for 15 hours at minimum wage. You would lose your allowance. Thank you. No wonder there in um no wonder there was so much poverty and I would urge everyone to support this white paper. Thank you much, Lorna. Thank you. I'll now go to the vote again. I just want to chief with average groups. Can the first amendment in the name of Councillor Anderson, Nakal and Councillor Dawson? We vote against Lord Mayor. Councillor Cohen? We vote for my Lord Mayor. Councillor Campbell? We vote against. Councillor Hutchinson? We vote for my Lord Mayor. Councillor Dutton? Against Lord Mayor. Councillor Blackburn, I'm not sure Councillor Blackburn. Uh, Councillor David Blackburn, uh, uh, Councillor Adam Blackburn's internet's gone now. Um, uh, it's gone down, which is inside the we vote against. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And that vote has been last. We'll go to the second amendment in the name of Councillor Charwood. Councillor Dutton? We vote for Lord Mayor. Mm. Councillor Cohen? We have the same, Lord Mayor. We vote for. Okay, yeah. Councillor Cabell? Voting for. Councillor Hutchinson? Uh, MBS, we uh, abstain, my Lord Mayor. Councillor Dobson? For, Lord Mayor. Councillor Bird? Uh, we vote him for, Lord Mayor. That vote has been carried. We will now vote for the substantive motion in the name of Councillor Dowd. Councillor Dawson? We vote for, Lord Mayor. Councillor Cowan? We abstain, my Lord Mayor. Councillor Camel? We vote for. Councillor Hutchin, Austin? Uh, we have Dane, Lord Mayor. Councillor Dobson? For Lord Mayor. Councillor Blackburn? For Lord Mayor. That vote has been carried. And um, that just my members that this is full council and the phone went off. Are you going to be honest enough, Councillor Gosson, to contribute to the charity? <laughs> <laughs> Whoever's phone is? 
I'm, I'm sure whoever it is will be on it. And it, it was Councillor Council, I'm sure my lord man. <laughs> but whoever it is, sorry Councillor Council to cancel you, but I'm fine who it is. Thank you. Can we move on to the third white paper, the name of Councillor Lewis? Can I call him Councillor Lewis? Uh, thank you, um, Lord Mayor. The last white paper at the end of a day was a bit longer than we expected, so hopefully this will not be controversial. Um, we are looking at a situation now that is completely unprecedented. Um, unprecedented. Um, start of our white paper, we um, had our basic into the uh, public sector workers, key work and local volunteers that have helped us through a crisis. Um, it would be remiss of me not to uh, thank our area monitor and the team at NET. All the work we've done set up a, a food bank in, in, in one of our communities to make sure people get fed and also look well at home cover part of our ward as well. And I think this illustrates the scale of how, as all our members have said, during the course of today's meeting, that everybody has stood up to support our community during this event. That is, uh, that is fine and, and, and we all welcome that, but as we look forward, we need to make sure we've got council and the voluntary sector left that can continue to do that, particularly if we fall into a second wave, um, which I know people are predicting could happen later this year. We're looking at a position now where um, World Council in his financial position in any other year, we'd have already been looking at going through a section 114 notice um, and all that entails. Um, we are, I cannot underestimate the severity of the situation we are in. We set a budget in February um, that in August phase intended to last us through this year, yet we've seen a £200 million black hole open up against that budget, both in terms of things we had to pay for during the COVID crisis, including uh, food, PPE, extra money to support social care, but also the loss of income was using council facilities closed and also uh, to follow government guidance. We've also seen uh, businesses and most important people struggling and people struggling to um, uh, make um, um, pay to work council services that they would expect. This is a position we're in this position that us along with every other council is having to face up to. Our figures are quite stark at the June Executive Board that uh, we're looking at £117.8 million deficit for next year's budget and that next week's executive board we're looking at a £64 million deficit for this year's budget and that's after we receive £70 million from the uh, government to help us award um, our costs but we are still a long way off. If we don't um, if we don't manage balance our budget we are looking at devastating consequences for both our ability to deliver public services, our ability to fund the voluntary sector in Leeds and our ability as a city to respond to COVID crisis. At the start of this crisis the Conservative Secretary of State said local council will get everything needed and we need a lot more. We've been constructive in the way we've engaged with government, but we don't believe they've given us enough support so far, and that's what this white paper um, uh, notes. We said, um, we said continue to meet in support council staff and our bunch of partners. Those staff that have served so well and worked so hard during this crisis could, if the situation is resolved, be facing compulsory redundancy in this autumn as a result of the government not helping us out. We know the country faces, and we call everybody to support our white paper. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Eden? Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Um, I'd like to join my colleagues and express my deepest sympathies to everyone who has lost someone they love to COVID-19. And all those who lost a loved one for whatever reason, um, and were not able to mourn them in the way that we normally do. I also echo everyone's comments and paying tribute to our key workers who have kept leads running during this very difficult time. It's clear from many of the speeches today that councils and council workers, including our own, have played a huge role in responding to the pandemic. It's therefore disappointing, but not surprising, that the government is acknowledging that contribution by giving us financial support and certainty at this time when we and our residents have never needed more. I don't think it's too much to ask that the government reimburses us for, for lost income and extra spending during the pandemic, particularly when we were told that the government would do whatever is necessary to support us. We believe that, and now we have to pay for the consequences of having relied yet again on a broken promise from government. Last announcement from government, the latest fund, the, in the last announcement from government, the latest funding package was described as comprehensive. Comprehensive means that we'll have to show the first five percent of our lost income and twenty-five percent of the rest of it. Comprehensive leaves us a funding gap of twenty-five million this year alone, and this is after ten years of slash cuts to local authority funding. It's hard to believe that this is the best the government could come up with. When we we made several suggestions on how they could help um, help provide us the funding. The public words Lombard debt could be written off, or at least reduce the interest rate for our debt, given the government itself now borrow record low rate. NHS providers have had over 13 billion of debt written off during the crisis. So why aren't councils, as social care providers, given the same courtesy? Lord Mayor, lead to step up to the step up during this crisis to support our residents. So I'm calling on the government to support us. I can cancel Lucy's white paper. Thank you. Thank you. That comes Councillor Robinson to move the amendment. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And uh, in light of the Leeds United scarf behind Councillor Lewis, I thought he said something unprecedented. I thought Leeds United get promoted. 
Um, but we know that that will be a huge boost to the city when they are promoted. And another huge boost to the city, I hope that all members back the amendment that I propose today. Because the amendment that seems to, doesn't uh, strike a to diminish the challenge or hard work that's already taken place, actually to bring us all together to meet that challenge. Now, we've been informed that the budget gap is 200 million, and in light of the very recent rounds of funding and what's just been said by other members and confirmed by the finance team as well, it's 64 million in 2020 2021 period. That is still a significant challenge. The government have offered a plethora of different funding pots, including one that has allowed 20,000 people to not have to pay council tax this year, which is, is huge in protecting many of the hardest to reach residents and those from the lowest income grounds. But there is much more to be done. And that's what this amendment proposes. We already know that the budget in February sets out £28 million of savings that were required. We also already know the minimum revenue provision, essentially the process of not paying back the mortgage for a few years so you can get more cash in hand, has been, uh, has been one that's been followed. But now the chips come home to roost. We need to start paying that money back. And it's worth reminding council that the council debt stands at 2.2 billion at the moment and has gone up 800 million in the last five years alone. We didn't have COVID five years ago, that, it, that debt has increased to the council's decisions and choices. And now we must make some more difficult choices. So the, what my member proposes four things. Firstly, a cross-party working group to form the budget. We all come together and seek to agree what we can and can't do and look at making those difficult decisions together. There are many difficult decisions that need to be taken, and we already know that decisions are being made now will have an impact on the future. It's better to form that cross-party budget working group now. Secondly, we've also suggested looking at the challenges that business face by having a business and economic support task for set up urgently. The Chamber of Commerce have shown in the past business confidence in Leeds is less native than other parts of Yorkshire. Businesses believe there is a robust way to bound back, but the council must be there to support them. Looking at the digital sector, global trade, actually our manufacturing sector as well. Thirdly, a cross-party working group to look at red tape and cutting regulation, and that includes changing some of the planning system here in Leeds to make a more nimble organisation to meet these challenges. And finally, all of this culminates in Chief Executive producing a renewed economic strategy and a debt recovery plan we can all, across all parties, have confidence in. We're all going to have to face a new normal. It's time to work differently. It's time to work together. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Arrington. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. In second Councillor Robinson's amendment, I'd first like to draw attention to similarities between the Conservative group motion and that of Councillor Lewis. While there are clearly some differences between our respective positions, there is also a lot of common ground, and I think we can all agree just how devastating and how difficult the past four months have been. It's absolutely right that we recognise the resilience of Leeds residents and local communities from Webby to Wheatwood and from Garber to Geisley. Our communities have stuck together and tried to find a way through these exceptionally difficult times. My Lord Mayor, I think we all, as full council, appreciate the extraordinary efforts of NHS and social care staff, all the key workers in emergency services, teachers and thousands of volunteers have all helped to get our city through this crisis. Our efforts have been extraordinary and it is right that we all put on record our thanks to those individuals and local organisations such as neighbourhood networks who have made a massive contribution to our city. Councillor Lewis's motion and Councillor Hedden's speech also quite rightly refer to those who have lost their lives during this pandemic. We should remember them and our condolences and sympathies go out to those who have experienced loss as a result of COVID-19. For many, life will never be the same again, and we should remember those that we've lost. My Lord Mayor, whilst it's right to remember the past and right to acknowledge the selfish contributions that many people have made, it is also incumbent upon us to look for the future, seek to develop and deliver a blueprint for how Leeds will recover over the coming months and years. Councillor Robinson has already highlighted ways that we think that can be done. We should put our local businesses, local entrepreneurs and local workforce at the heart of the city's recovery. As an ex-mayor of a market town, I know how important local economy is to the community and the wider area. My Lord Mayor, the private sector has made these what it is today, an economic powerhouse of the North, and we are certain that they will play a leading role in the recovery that must now come. Yes, we should lobby government for additional money, urge them to provide more assistance where it's needed. The council faces significant financial crashes. We absolutely understand that and will, on a cross-party basis, support efforts to get additional funding, particularly in areas where income has been lost, such as business rates and council tax, and more widely across services would normally generate millions of pounds of income each year to the authority. As Councillor Robinson said, this is a huge financial challenge and one that we will have to work together on to resolve. But my Lord Mayor, can we realistically expect government to write off previous debt accrued over the last 15 years? We should lobby for support, but the problems posed by MRP were there before coronavirus. They have now been exacerbated, that is true. That remains, borrowing levels have increased significantly over the past five years, as Councillor Robinson said. Let's work together and let's lobby together to get more money for our city. And on final sentence, Lord Mayor, and let us also take responsibility to develop our own solutions, as well as seeking enhanced partnership and support from government. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Thank you. Councillor David Blackburn. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I, I speak in support of the motion in the name of Councillor Lewis. I think 
that it's a sensible way forward. I think it's balanced and it's one that we should all get behind. Um, the fact is, the success we've had in dealing with coronavirus so far has been that we are stuck, basically stuck together. Um, clearly, at that, we are now at a stage where we're now trying to recover and we are dealing with the financial consequences of much of what has happened. And in fairness, governments have been helpful uh, in, in that during that process. But we have now, both this year, next year, and probably the year after, going to be in a financial position that puts us all in jeopardy. Government ministers understand and have said that local, we couldn't have done what we did without local government. What we have to do is we have to protect local government and we need government to support us. And not necessarily always by direct giving us funding, but allowing ways and means that we can get around uh, some of the problems that we have. Uh, but that has got to be done and they have got to support us because if we get another wave, uh, we, there will be nobody there to make sure that things turn out okay on the other side. I, I feel the, the Tory amendment doesn't actually appreciate that, although there is one aspect of the Tory amendment which I would suggest to the administration that might want to adopt, and that is the setting up of a, a cross-party working group on the budget. Um, with the best will in the world, uh, we have a good have to make some very, very difficult decisions in the near future, and the best way to do that is to get consensus across party. So I would ask the administration to do that, but my group will be supporting the administration's web paper. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Thanks a lot, Mayor. Um, interesting following on David Blackburn, I, I found very little to disagree with, I have to say. Um, in terms of cross-party approach to budgets, I actually think that our budget process each year is pretty cross-party because we do share all the information that there is in terms of what the council's budget is and what the uh, uh, underlying uh, financial formula is as well. And then as, lo as local parties, we offer our own uh, solutions to uh, what the council had in front of it. And the majority of the times, as he mentioned by Councillor Carter, every time he puts his budget forward, 95% of stuff we'll agree on. So, um, actually setting up a special multi-party group to look at it, I'm not sure that would actually help. We just need to make sure we share information that we already have. Uh, in terms of how the council grows, I am concerned about how the Conservative Amendment focuses primarily just on the private sector. Um, and talking about how we need to help the digital sector do it does. I think the council actually does a pretty good job at highlighting and encouraging the digital sector. I think what we're lacking, really, is any kind of focus on developing our local economies. And I think there's something that's been brought forward by COVID and actually need to have far more emphasis on and far more investment by the council in. Behind me, you'll notice we have the, the historic Rothwell Council offices. It's assets like that could be put to use. Currently, it's done under the council and the community to use to sell per a civic enterprise and encourage uh, micro enterprises uh, and to get the town centre going again. And those are the kind of initiatives that the council can back up. Councillor Robbins is talking about deregulating and loosening up planning system. I'm sorry, but that is a real red herring. And, and I, would, I would have thought that most of the councillors who are uh, familiar with the planning system appreciate it. it's not this council that's at holding up um, house building happening in this city. Generally, it's the big developers and land banking. So, you focus on the local. Let's make sure that our asset-based community development actually means what we, we say it is and make sure that every community in the city is enabled to set up social infrastructure and to encourage the micro-enterprises that are needed in a whole new way of delivering economic growth. Thank you. Carla Jenkins? Oh, sorry, sorry, Carla Jenkins. Well, <laughs> sorry, Councillor Dobson, sorry. Not at all, though, Mayor. Um, thank you. I'll just put my... That's better. Um, this is probably, I think, in my 14 years on this council, the most important white paper we've debated. Every budget setting, the groups will form their opinion about the administration's budget, and we have the opportunity to discuss that in the February meeting. So it's utterly pointless to go over that again and dissect what bits of the budget we thought were appropriate and which bits we didn't. Because, frankly, we have crossed the Rubicon. No matter what any of us thought of the administration's budget in February, it is gone. It is finished. It is blown out of the water by a completely unprecedented set of events. And therefore, I think we do need to have a radical rethink about how this council, in the short term, approaches its financial situation going forward at least for another uh, cycle in the next budget, because frankly, we are in really unprecedented times. It would be Pointless, uh, foolish and patristic to point fingers at certain projects of administration and say it's all so. Because this isn't a moment for water. This is actually a moment where we need to come together as a collective and make the decisions, all 99 of us, um, about how we see our city going forward and collectively lobby. 
the government on what is required. Uh, Jim's made some points around local services being in jeopardy, voluntary sector and staffing. Um, all valid, but I would add that it's still against the backdrop of projects that we could and should now be looking to urgently jettison because those local services, voluntary sector and staff have to come first and have to be top of that collective priority. I also think the reality is the government have done reasonably well by the city so far. And I'll add the caveat, I do think our last five years' financial strategies have left us less than resilient in terms of the position we now find ourselves in. But it's irrelevant. What is relevant is the fact that this is a watershed moment for Leeds, for the country, the biggest peacetime emergency that any of us hopefully will have ever to face. We won't go as far as supporting Matthew's amendment because, again, of stuff like planning, forget it. No relaxation of plan for those who've got the whipbacks over the back will understand why. But I do honestly believe now is the time for a cross party setting around a financial arrangement. Let's genuinely work together. We might not always get along, but this is unprecedented. We need to get behind one another and the people of Leeds. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Jenkins. And Mayor, I'm pleased to support Labour White Pepper WP3 in the name of Councillor James Lewis. Let us be clear 10 years of austerity policies have left the council in need of help. Austerity is weak in local government, the NHS and the care system, so the ability to respond to COVID-19 has been a drain on our resources. Our reserves have been used to maintain the services that we need as a, as a city to make up for the 254 million Tory government grants lost over the last 10 years. This is a well-run council, like the sadly bankrupt North Hattonshire, which had to be bailed out. Let us look at the large crisis, the bank crisis of 2008. It cost one point two trillion. And amazingly, the banks in the city paid off debt by 2017, leaving only 56 million short. And during the period in poverty increase, see a Marmot report of 2020, the value of the stock exchange grew from 2.6 trillion in 2009 to 4.2 trillion in 2015, and even during COVID, stands now at 3.7 trillion. And dividends have still been paid shareholders, increasing from 60 billion in 2009 to 110 billion in 2019. And the richest 1,000 have seen their wealth increase by 538 billion since 2008. The current crisis has cost us 350 billion. This is why Millionaires for Humanity in their letter this week say that they have a critical role to play in healing our world. We do have the money, a lot of it, and we ask governments to raise taxes on people like us. Sadly, in the letter, there's no, there's no secretaries or a few secretaries missing, such as billionaire inhabitants of the Virgin Islands, for example. All we're asking for is a fair taxation system so that a forest of magic money trees can share wealth and deal with inequalities in this country, in the world, and climate change. We can work together in the same sort of just morality which support the most vulnerable in society that has been done through the core cities and county councils who were each warning of a collapse in services without financial guarantees from government. We need a social care system urgently to be properly funded to meet the clean needs of the post-COVID generation population. Finally, Philip Alston from the United Nations said when he retired last week that even before COVID-19 we squandered a decade in the fight against poverty. Economic growth is presented as the engine for eradicating poverty. After years of growth, the main beneficiaries have been the wealthiest. The money can be found and should support our public services as the cornerstone of a civilised society. We are asking very nicely. Thank you. Councillor Cunningham? <coughs> Councillor Thank you. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, may I start, first of all, by also paying respect to everyone who's lost loved ones during this pandemic. I welcome this white paper. It was hugely encouraging when announcements were made by the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, stating that government would do whatever is necessary to support councils throughout the pandemic. I thought that finally the government might understand the positive impact a well-run, ambitious local council can have in its area. Unfortunately, what we've received so far hasn't lived up that promise at all. Leeds to Council did so much to invest in inclusive growth across Leeds, supporting people, base and productivity. We've seen the growth of late nights attract thousands of people into the city centre each year and we're planning to deliver a great programme of events through the Year of Culture in 2023. We support thousands of visitors each year to develop their skills through job shops, apprenticeships, schemes and other council services and investments. And we also invest in innovation in delivering our services and supporting local startups. In my own ward of Omley, we see this with targeted investment and intervention to tackle poverty and support growth in the priority neighbourhood New Whitley. And just a shout out, during the crisis, the New Whitley Community Association has to be commended for stepping to the beach and acting as a COVID-19 response for Omley. I'm sure my colleagues, including those across the virtual floor, will join me in recognising the extra support which is going to be needed to support our local communities, small businesses and local shopping centres post-pandemic. These things are difficult to achieve when we set to lose over £100 million, even after the extra funding the government has provided as a result of the pandemic. 
Prime Minister has said he wants to level up Britain and the government is not responding with austerity. Well, leveling up Britain and dealing with the North South divide will require investing in councils all across the North, but especially our economic centres such as Leeds. The evolution will help here, but there's only so much we can do with more powers if we've also got less money. Councils and Leeds City Council in particular have a huge role in developing and strengthening our local economies. To do that, we need more funding, more flexibility and long-term certainty. We need that certainty so that we can go back to our communities and support them and work with them to rebuild some of the devastating effects that the COVID-19 pandemic has had upon their lives and their livelihoods. And it's disappointing that the government doesn't seem to realise that. To help Leeds recover from the impact of COVID-19, I'm betting in favour of this white paper. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Can I call up Councillor Lewis now, Summer? Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. And uh, I'll start by welcoming uh, the tone of all comments that have been uh, made tonight. I think the recognition from uh, people, including um, Councillor Dobson and many others that have spoken about the seriousness of the situation, I think the line position we're in at Council. I won't mention all the speakers in the day, but those speakers, um, Councillor Cunningham and Goldton Harrington, who talked about the need for the council to uh, support the um, private sector and work together. That's really vital for us. We know um, before COVID government was moving us towards more reliant on business rates income as a council, so having that strong partnership is really important for the future of the council and wouldn't underestimate that. As Councillor Jensen said, well, you know, part of how we come through this is going to be a different way of doing things to see um, rich come forward and say we won't be taxed more to be part of it. Some of this isn't just about how we cut the cake, but it's about the size of the cake in terms of public spending, particularly we know uh, government borrowing is at record levels, uh, potentially three times higher even than it was um, during the global crisis of the um, decade for last. So no, the seriousness of the um, situation. And, and like I say, home debate I think has uh, supported that. I think, I think there is, um, um, you know, I, um, I don't go in too far into the past in the positive tone of the debate, but there's a couple of comments, particularly from um, Council Robinson, I, I, I wish to pick up. I think some of the financial approaches we've taken to maintain budget have been a consequence of um, the amount of money we have taken away from us in terms of uh, government grant reductions. And again, worth reflecting, it's been many years now since the government allocation of resources to us, which still, in terms of our share of business rates, other grants and council tax, is controlled by central government. We are one of the most centralised country in the country country of the world, we have seen 1.7 billion taken away and that's impacted uh, not just our um, services but also some of the decisions um, we made. Um, I would say that our um, we draw a distinction between borrowing and frontline services. If a conservative group uh, don't want uh, borrowing then they say which elements of the capital programme they don't wish to see uh, when it comes to the budget debate next year but I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll get to that at that point. I think again uh, these are points I've made. Certainly um, as an administration I don't think uh, we're going to apologise for investing in our uh, for mining our services, uh, putting me uh, where we uh, um, have done. That said, we do face a particularly difficult challenge ahead. Um, I agree with all the comments that have been made about how we need to work in cross party, um, cross party fashion, and that's got to be central to this. But this is just about figuring the processes we've talked about. Actually, it's about impact on our ability to the social services, uh, about people whose jobs are at risk, both that work directly for the council and organisations we fund, and we can't, in, and we can't underestimate. As, as other speakers have commented on, including Council Aidan, the huge Lewis. social impact of this course. So I move my white people on there. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll go into the vote. And in the amendment of Councillor Robinson, again, I just saw that she whips. Councillor Glasses? We vote against Lord Mayor. Councillor Coyne? We vote in favour, Lord. Councillor Campbell? We vote against. <clears throat> Councillor Hodgson? Oh, we vote for this one, my Lord. Councillor Dobson? We abstain, Lord Mayor. Councillor Blackburn? We abstain, Lord Mayor. Um, after that, this amendment has been lost. Should we vote in motion of Councillor Lewis? Councillor Dawson? We vote for, Lord Mayor. Councillor Cohen? I'd say, my Lord, the temptation to call for a recorded vote is really. We <laughs> <laughs> abstain, my Lord. <laughs> Councillor Campbell? Vote for. <clears throat> Councillor Hudson? Uh, we are staying, Lord Mayor. Councillor Dobson? We vote for, Lord Mayor. Councillor Blackburn? For, Lord Mayor. Thank you. And this motion has been carried. Thank you. Ooh, we can, well, I can breathe now. We have come to the end of the programme. But before we finish, I'd like to thank um, all members for your patience yesterday. It has been a very challenging, difficult meeting. But thank you. Also, I'd like to thank all the actors that take part in arranging for today to happen. Many of you know it's a couple of weeks trying, but technology let us down. And also, ID staff, I want to thank them for the work that they have done to make a remote meeting go ahead. So, thank you.
was going to say, say Jerry, enjoy the rest of the afternoon and say, say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. 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 Thank